Welcome everyone to the Holy Sparks podcast. Saul K here, super excited and grateful as always. And I have a very special interview for you this morning. Without further ado, let me edify and introduce the man properly. Ron Hasner teaches international conflict and religion. He is the recipient of Berkeley's Undergraduate Political Science Association's Distinguished Teaching Award, the Berkeley Division of Social Sciences Distinguished Teaching Award, Berkeley's Campus-Wide Distinguished Teaching Award, and the American Political Science Association's Outstanding Teaching in Political Science Award. He is the editor-in-chief of the journal Security Studies and the editor of the Cornell University Press book series, Religion and Conflict. In 2023, he received a Distinguished Scholar Award from the Religion and International Relations sections of the International Studies Association. Later that year, he received the Suzanne Hober Rudolph Outstanding Scholar in Religion and Politics Award from the American Political Science Association. He is the faculty director of the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. He holds the Helen Diller Family Chair in Israel Studies at UC Berkeley. Ron, welcome to the Holy Sparks podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Delighted to be here. Thank you so much for making some time this morning. You have an amazing story and great things happening. And uh, if you would, I'd like people to get to know you a little bit. And maybe you can talk a little bit about growing up Jewish in America. So I did not grow up Jewish in America. I grew up Jewish, but not in America. My parents, my grandparents were all sort of Holocaust survivors and children of Holocaust survivors and eventually made their way uh, to Israel. And that's where I grew up. And then I started studying overseas. So I didn't come to America until I was 24 years old. So I've been here a little more than half my life. I grew up very secular in Israel. And during my uh, PhD here in the United States, I met my now wife. And we celebrated our 25th anniversary since our first date three days ago while while I sat here in my office. And that's my background. Perhaps it's worth uh, pointing out in this context that American Judaism remains a very curious encounter for me. We've been members of various synagogue communities over the years, but I don't come from a very pious or very observant observant background. We celebrate uh, Jewish holidays with tremendous joy. I'm surrounded by Jewish and non-Jewish friends at all times. So for me, becoming the center of attention of a pretty large Jewish community now is, is an extreme honor. I love it. And how would you define or differentiate, a lot of Israelis call it um, secular or traditional in Israel. And then over here, secular means something else. How do you differentiate? I would say very much secular and not just traditional, but really quite secular, which of course we understand in Judaism has nothing to do with belief, right? It has to do primarily with practice. So I identify strongly as Jewish. Family members of mine identify strongly as Jewish, but you won't find us praying too often. Multiple Chabad rabbis have been in my office in the last few days, eager to get me uh, to put on tefillin, and I said I wasn't quite ready for that. I should note on the topic of tefillin, I come from a rather religious family. My great-grandfather was the chief rabbi of one of the largest communities in Eastern Europe. He was the chief rabbi of Chernovitz, uh, murdered during the Holocaust, as was much of his family. His wife, my great-grandmother, testified at the Eichmann trial. Wow. And I have the tefillin of his son, who perished in, in Auschwitz. And I've, I've occasionally, occasionally placed them, but but yeah, that's about as 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 far as I'll go. Shabbat is important, tradition is important, values are important. I consider because perhaps because I'm Israeli in my background, I consider Hebrew poetry, Yiddish theater. I consider all of these to be part of my Jewish identity. And now being surrounded by community of Jewish students essentially from the moment I open my door in the morning, which is at nine, although they're welcome to knock at any time, until I uh, kick out the last student group from my office at around 11, 11.30. So you're the de facto Rebbe on campus. I'd like to think that I'm the uh, uh, Jewish uncle in absentia uh, on campus, right? If, if, you, if you're hungry and you need to eat, if something unpleasant happened to you and you need a shoulder to cry on, if you're over 21 and you've really undergone a difficult time and you want a little sip of, of Kiddush wine, we can do that too in, in, in good company. So yeah, that's, my, that's how I see my function. Okay, I love it. And we're going to fast forward to the current situation in just a moment. But uh, at what point in your life and career did you, uh, you want to be an educator? 
as with many career choices, I bet yours too, Saul, I never made a concerted deliberation, right? Was I going to be a surgeon? Was it going to be, what are our options as to you? Surgeon, doctor, lawyer. I enjoyed myself tremendously always in class and at school. I've, I admired uh, many great teachers that I've had, did well in college, wanted to do more. And so degree after degree, essentially just to stay around libraries and professors and knowledge and investigation. And eventually I had a PhD and then discovered to my delight. And this just show you, shows you how bad the advice was that I've been given over the years. There was really nobody for me to consult with. And neither one of my parents graduated college. It's a, people suddenly told me that with a PhD, you could teach. I had no idea. <laughs> and, and I thought, that's great. Let's do that. And then was very fortunate to get this job at UC Berkeley. And I've been teaching now for exactly, almost exactly 20 years. Amazing. And was Berkeley your first gig? My first and Bezrat Hashem, my last. Mm -hmm. Why Berkeley? PhDs in political science do not have the luxury of much choice in terms of jobs. My PhD is from another university in the Bay Area that I cannot name because I am a Berkeley professor, but it's a small, small private school, not too far away from here. And my wife, who's a Bay Area native, said, boy, it would be great if we could stay in the Bay Area. I told her that there was no chance of that happening because Stanford does not hire its own graduates. And what are the odds of a Berkeley job? But then through a string of good fortune and coincidences and a little bit of gumption, the job opened up and I got an interview and I seemed to have done better than other interview candidates and, and was hired. Amazing. That was 20, you said 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk about the differences between a Jewish life on Stanford versus Cal campus uh, a little bit later, but talk about, we're going to fast forward now to October 7th, you around campus. What was your experience of it? Wow. October 7th. So I, I, we haven't said, although you said it in your introduction that I teach war, I teach Berkeley's introductory war class to about mm, 200 to 300 students every fall. I teach another class called war in the Middle East. I'm very interested in religion. The events of October 7, before I understood them, and I don't think any one of us understood them in the first hours, I thought were just a tragic and fascinating case of terrorism. Wow. We thought Hamas was mollified, and here they are engaging in what seems like a very violent attack. And then the reality emerged of exactly what had happened and how long it would take for this to play out. And it was just, it was deeply shocking. It was deeply shocking, but I've been observing Israel from the Berkeley campus long enough to know that grief about Israel turns into anger at Israel at the drop of a hat. I could see that coming from a mile away. I felt this case would be different. It seemed like a very easy test for Palestinian activists, for extremists on the left, for Arab voices. It should be very easy to say we support a two-state solution, we support an end to occupation, but we will not support this. This is beyond the pale. And everybody failed the test. Everybody. Jewish Voice for Peace failed the test. Black Lives Matter failed the test. Feminists failed the test. Anti-Israel protesters failed the test. Faced with the choice of negating even a small fraction of, of the violence that happened on October 7, they went all in. They went all in. They thought this was absolutely fantastic. What a great struggle for liberation. And that was shocking to everybody. That was extremely offensive. Even at a university that is you know, very cautious in its expressions and in its political stance, the administration came out with a letter that said, October 7 is beyond the pale and support for terrorism on our campus is unacceptable. And then within a couple of days, my colleagues and I had gathered 350 faculty signatures from Berkeley faculty opposing support for Hamas and violence and rape and mutilation on our campus. Seems like a no-brainer, but Hamas supporters and, and anti-Israel agitators, I thought these were two different groups, but they're not doing a good job distinguishing themselves from one another. They've stuck with their story. They have not changed their account. And I think that just that in of itself was shocking to everybody, especially, of course, Jewish students. And there was also a very shortly thereafter, there was a walkout for Gaza in which you purportedly students were receiving extra credit in some classes for going on that, that march. Talk about that 
That's so we've good. had the luxury at Berkeley, unlike at Harvard, Brown, all these other campuses that have been in the limelight and have embarrassed themselves. We've had the luxury of dealing with contentious student politics for years, right? This is Berkeley. And the faculty here have created various forums for dealing with these issues years ago. We are the founding campus of Students for Justice in Palestine. We are the first American campus in which students attempted and failed to pass BDS resolution after BDS resolution. It always ends in failure, but that doesn't matter. So we are ready for all these things. We have this committee and that committee. I co-direct the largest Israel Studies Institute in the United States. I sit on the board of the Center for Jewish Studies. I sit on the board of the Chancellor's Committee on Jewish Life. We have an amazing Hillel and Chabad, a lot of powerful institutions. In that sense, we were, were able to respond to these things when it wasn't actually a professor, it was a teaching assistant who offered extra credit. And within an hour, we had alerted the administration. So a student reached to us, we reached the administration, sent out an email. If you know anything about Berkeley, these things usually take a month or two to just create policy. But in this particular case, the email came within an hour to say, you can't do that. I'll only note, Saul, that in this national walkout for uh, Hamas against Gaza, I don't even know what it was called, in which really in classroom after classroom, students stood up, usually students who couldn't find Israel on a map, if you paid them, stood up to say, that's it, I'm walking out, join me whoever can. I am told that 400 people gathered on Sprawl Plaza that day. Mm -hmm. Some of them students, some of them not. Even if all 400 were students, our student body is 40,000. Right. So a nebishtic 1% right. showed up. Most of the students on campus, I'm going to repeat this again and again, because the people who haven't been on the Berkeley campus don't know that 98% of the students on campus are utterly disinterested in Israel, in the Palestinians, I would say perhaps even in world politics. They, that's not why they're here. They're here to get a degree in engineering or a law degree or a computer science degree and make a ton of money. Even the big counter march, Jewish students and their allies marching this Monday, yeah. Oh, yeah. which was 300 students. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you were there, Saul, but okay. you could. It was a beautiful march, and we can talk about it if you like. But it happened during lunchtime. Sproul Plaza was full of students going from one class to the next. Nobody seemed particularly interested. Of course, the protesters that say the gate were interested. The Jewish counter protesters were interested. There were there was lots of media, but it's not like campus came to a halt. Okay. Students kept milling back and forth, going from one class to the next, chatting with one another. Hey, what's going on over there? I'm not quite sure. One of the beauties of protest, and I'm enjoying that right now, is that very few can speak very loudly. I'm one of those few. But the Berkeley campus as a whole could not care less. Mm -hmm. And this could probably be true for any. Absolutely. What do you think happened here during the free Tibet protests of the 80s? Remember Richard Gere and the Dalai Lama? Again, there were sometimes six people, sometimes 100 people, sometimes 1,000 people. Two weeks later, it's all gone. Nobody on this campus remembers that there's a war in Ukraine. It's gone. The war in Ukraine is over because everybody is focused on Israel right now. I hope the war in Gaza ends soon. I assure you, Saul, that two weeks after that, nobody will be talking about Israel. The only reason they're talking about it is because it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah, I was walking across campus once with a Middle Eastern language professor, Professor Porter, and we were talking about the Middle East, and we were all fired up, and there were kids in the middle of Sproul Hall literally throwing pies in each other's faces. I was like, oh yeah, college. Yep. Right? But for the Jewish students on campus, and certainly the Muslim students on campus, this is very salient and very relevant, and every single day they're thinking about it. So how would you say the climate changed of UC Berkeley for Jewish students prior to 10-7 versus now? Just sum it up. I think in ways that parallel the Jewish experience around the United States, I'll summarize it in two words. Wake up. A real slap in the face, a real wake-up call, not because the anti-Israel agitators, and I should note, there are no pro-Palestinian agitators on the Berkeley campus. There have never been pro-Palestinian agitators. Nobody here on campus cares about improving the quality of Palestinian lives or supporting Palestinian society or sending medical supplies or money or food or worrying about the corruption in the Palestinian leadership. The agitators here are anti-Israeli. And I would say they're hate-filled anti-Israel. They're not driven by love. Nobody's surprised that they responded the way they did, in part because the war in Gaza is awful. People are dying. 
by the many thousands. What surprised people, I think, was that their purported allies, who Jewish students had stood by to support, to aid, whether it was LGBT students, whether it was African-American students, Latinos, progressives in general, I would say that they just abandoned the Jewish students, mm -hmm. just dropped them like a hot potato. But you see this, see this around the United States. Even my family and I, of course, we supported Black Lives Matter. How can you not support a movement against racism? Until Black Lives Matter, again, as I said, just drops you like a hot potato, like you're nothing. And I think that was a very important wake-up call, especially to students who had sold their soul to the progressive movement, thinking, as Jews have often thought, if we only play nice with the most extremists in our society that we can, surely they will love us even though we're Jewish. Surely they will forget that we're Jewish. Surely they will accept us as just Americans. And then it turns out all you need is a snap of a finger and and suddenly we're the Jews again. And they don't support us. No feminist has spoken up. No big, important feminist. In fact, the campus's flagship uh, feminist, Judith Butler, has praised Hamas and uh, does not recognize Jewish vic rape victims as rape victims because they're Jewish. Yeah, that's that was, I think, really shocking. I'm I learned a new expression a couple of days ago in my office, which is filled constantly with people. October 8th Jew, somebody who officially on paper was Jewish, but hadn't thought of themselves as Jewish, hadn't closely identified with a Jewish identity. And then October 7th comes around and they wake up on October 8th and suddenly everybody's treating them as a Jew. And they understand that they cannot live without Israel, that Israel is deeply connected to who they are and how people see them, whether they like it or not. They can try to not be connected to Israel, but they'll other people will affiliate them. Other people will write free Palestine on their synagogue, regardless of who's inside. Other people will attack their lectures, regardless of their speech, because they're Israeli or because they're Jewish. My only statement in response to the uh, war for the first three months, the only public statement I made was a um, proclamation signed by myself and by a Palestinian colleague, a very extremist Palestinian colleague, in which we both begged our students to not engage in violence. That was my only public statement on the war. And nonetheless, there was anti-Semitic graffiti against me. There were posters put up on my classroom. Ron Hasner is a genocide supporter. Yeah, not because of what I said, because I didn't say anything other than ask for peace. I didn't say anything, but because I'm Jewish and because I'm Israeli. So that's, of course, horrible. It's also part of Jewish history, right? Like when do the most integrated German Jews in the 1930s discover that they can't integrate enough. They can't do enough to abandon their Jewish identity. They will be seen as Jewish one way or another. Yeah, they discovered it at a bad time. But there's also this amazing awakening on campus. Okay. Jewish students are coming to Hillel, to Chabad, to talks about Judaism, to talks about Israel in tremendous numbers. They're banding together. They're meeting one another in my office. They're creating sort of new friendships and uh, new relationships. That's wonderful to see, despite the very, very unfortunate circumstances. I got it. Okay, so let's talk about your sit-in, if that's what you're calling it. I know there's three specific goals, but tell our audience about that. About a month ago, anti-Israel agitators blocked the main gate to campus, that's Seder Gate. They're blocking it partially with their bodies, partially with posters, partially with ropes and chains. And they're harassing students walking through, especially Jewish students or Jewish students they know to be Jews or students wearing Stars of David or Hebrew writing on their t-shirt. And the administration asked them to cease. The Jewish community has asked them to cease. Sometimes they lie and say that they will, and then they don't. Most of the time, they just refuse to budge. That's been there for a month. And the Jewish students swallowed their pride and said, we're, we're going to fight this through the administration, through the bureaucracy. Two weeks later was the infamous incident at Zelaba Hall, in which the same people blocking the gate broke the doors to the to a lecture, smashed the glass in Zelaba Hall, harmed multiple students, including a student who was strangled. I saw her here in my office with striation marks. What are they called? Strangulation marks around her neck. 
and, and the students escaped through a tunnel by assistance of the police. And then everybody really got fed up and a little scared, frankly. And the gate still wasn't opened. Then the Jewish community, left, right, and center, on campus said, that's it, we're marching through the gate. And many faculty members and administrators begged them to please wait. The administration will take care of this. And so they waited one more week, and then they said, that's it, we're done. And they declared a march to break through the gate, which I was tremendously worried about, having, again, issued that statement about peace on campus and nonviolence. I was worried that the violent goons who were standing by the gate, who had already harmed multiple students, were going to clash with these 300 Jewish marchers, who did indeed on Monday march across campus wearing white. Um, and so both to exert pressure on the administration and to relieve pressure from Jewish students to say, you don't have to do this with your bodies. You're not alone. Faculty standing by you. I'm not the only one. Come to my office. Let's talk. You're, you're being supported. Uh, I did this. I started the sit-in. Uh, I am now on day six. I brought a mattress uh, and some pillows and a suitcase into my office. I eat here. I sleep here. I teach here. Uh, I'm lucky to have a, a bathroom one floor up, so I can use that. I haven't washed in a week, which is unpleasant for everybody. And that's the sit-in or sleep-in or whatever you want to call it. I thought it was going to be a rather sort of solitary monastic experience, meditative perhaps, that I was going to sit alone in my office and contemplate anti-Semitism and Jewish history. My family ensured before I left that I would have a DoorDash account so I could order food. None of this turned out to be true. And in fact, the main utility, the main product of this sit-in turns out has nothing to do with the march or with the administration. The main outcome, the main benefit is uh, a community space for students and not just Jewish students mm -hmm. they come by the dozens mm -hmm. you you were here Saul you you, okay. you saw that it was like Grand Central Station sometimes it's half a dozen students sometimes it's 20 students they come with parents alumni community members rabbis faculty members administrators they all bring food thank God my my coffee table here at the office is bending over with challah and matzo ball soup and salad and chicken and crackers and cookies and hamantash and so there's nonstop eating and talking and sharing. It's been really wonderful. It's been really wonderful. People have come from far and wide. Some of them show up at 8 o'clock in the morning. Some of them show up at 11 o'clock at night. I have not had a moment to myself. The last thing I'll say is it's a little like a shiva, mm -hmm. a little, in the sense that there's a, a, a very serious cause and there's a good deal of sadness. But the atmosphere in the room is uplifting because we have one another. Absolutely. Because people are constantly coming in and out to offer support, not so much to me, but really students to one another. Mm -hmm. I really don't have a minute to myself to clear my head, which is after all, one of the purposes of a Shiva. Mm -hmm. There's not stop eating. I am unshaven. I'm sitting on the floor. I'm unwashed. In many ways, it's a Shiva. And there's a little light in the window behind this curtain facing out into the street and into the campus that students can see at all hours of the day and night so they know that they can come visit. I love it. And yeah, it's a very uplifting space. If you're on or, or nearby campus, definitely pay them a visit. Definitely. A um, couple quick questions. I know that one of your goals of, of this sit is to clear Seder Gate, right? Just to open it which it was on the morning of the march, which I was in, which was very peaceful, actually very sweet and very like a great example of civil protest, right? How you can do it civilly. But last time I was there on campus, which was yesterday, there's still a big sign, there's people holding it. So what is the university actually doing? And what, if any, has there been any progress? So I'm not privy to what the university is doing. I'm sure they're doing what they can with limited law enforcement available to them, and also a very reasonable desire to not throw students into handcuffs and drag them away in a police van, which would look bad for the students, but it would be unpleasant for campus. So they've been negotiating, they've been removing the sign and the sign, a different sign goes up and then they remove it again and a different sign goes up. You know, it's a little strange because there's no shortage of places on the Berkeley campus to protest. You may have heard Saul, but there have been protests on the Berkeley campus before. Mm 
None of them have blocked Sather Gate or harassed students. So th there's no shortage of opportunity. Students must be allowed to protest. They must be. It's Berkeley. But that doesn't mean beating up other students. And again, in the last 80 or 60 years of protest on the Berkeley campus, nobody has seen fit of beating up their opposition. Yeah, the gate needs to be open to all students. It, okay. it can't be that there's a selectia happening at the gate right. in which some students are allowed through and others aren't, and some are harassed and others aren't. So that's my first request. I made no demands of the administration. They're all requests. Mm -hmm. My second request is that if a speaker is booed off stage, let alone changed by, chased by violent goons, the university will apologize to them and invite them back. And my third request was that staff on campus receive mandatory Islamophobia and anti-Semitism training. Okay, great. There's a point that I, I must bring up, which you may or may not have seen this email. So the students received an email from the chancellor on January 22nd, 2024, saying that they're providing one-time resources to UC campuses to address forms of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Palestinian, anti-Israel bias, etc. And there's a $700,000 grant for this. And do, you, do you know about this? Okay. Yes, this, this is coming from not UC Berkeley, but UC overall, UC, the UC. Grand UC, whatever that's called, UC Central. Okay, gotcha. Okay, but however, then if you read down in the fine print, it says on their website, what will not be supported through this initiative, new trainings related to anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Palestinian, anti-Israel biases. What? <clears throat> Again, I, I don't know the thinking that went into that, but here's how I interpreted it. And, and I should say many of my colleagues and, and my, my Israel Institute, uh, should, our Israel Institute, applied for some of that funding. The idea is to create new initiatives. And I think the idea is to create sort of new emergency initiatives, like we're going to bring 17 speakers over. We're going to create uh, a big conference. We're going to... So things that are now and brief and to address the current crisis... It's not a bad idea to say, if you want to institute training, that training should be forever. And that indeed is my request from the administration, that there be training built in and it would be required of everybody forever. That's a lot of fundraising. That's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. My beloved colleague, Ethan Katz, who is the real leader of the faculty, and in fact, I should say, the, in part, the real leader of the students on campus started several years ago, I think, it's fair to say years ago, an anti-Semitism education initiative. If you Google Berkeley anti-Semitism education initiative, you'll find that website and you'll find a fantastic 12-minute training video, which is part of a greater package. He's now fundraising. So that initiative can take place not just on our campus, but he's visited high schools, he's visited schools, he goes to other universities. He trained staff at other universities. That's a much bigger deal than this letter that you just read, which is intended to address October 7. But people are taking advantage of that too. They're creating forums where Muslims and Jews can sit together, where professors with an expertise in Israel and professors with an expertise in the Arab world can sit together. Those, those things don't contradict one another. The, the letter also says, uh, you didn't read that part, that they have to be new initiatives. So things we already have on campus, like the anti-Semitism training initiative, don't qualify because they want to invigorate and till the earth. I think that's great. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Something will come of it. I don't know. I don't think it's a solution to any problem. I am a big believer in the power of education. Uh -huh. I'm not even sure that education is a solution to the problem of anti-Semitism. It's been around for two, 3,000 years. But... I hear from my students when I teach them about anti-Semitism, they confess, and students don't often do that, they confess that they knew so, so little. They'd heard about the Holocaust. They'd heard that Jews are sometimes accused of doing things that they, they're not responsible for. But they haven't heard of basic vocabulary, Saul, that you and I and many of your listeners know. They've never heard the word blood libel. Yeah. They don't know what an expulsion is in, in that in the Jewish sense of the word. Mm -hmm. They they haven't heard of regulations around Jewish business and dress over over years in the Middle East and in Europe. They know very little about anti-Semitism in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. They have a warped notion of the relationship between anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and anti-Israel. Mm -hmm. Other than those things are not the same. That's the only thing they know, to which I say, that's great. Xenophobia and racism are also not the same, but 
boy, a lot of xenophobes are racist and a lot of racists are xenophobes. And the same is true of anti-Semites and anti-Zionists. And so education is great. And it's one small step towards addressing a bigger problem. Uh -huh. Okay. So I have uh, one hard question and then one final, very hard question for you. I'm bracing myself. So according to Jewish Virtual Library, UC Berkeley has received over $52 million in donations from the Arab states in the last 25 years, uh, not including about $3 billion of unaccounted funds, which is a whole other topic. How do you think, if at all, this plays into what's happening on campus and the school's response or lack thereof? Look, all centers for study of the world on campus our Center for European Studies, our Center for Asian Studies, our Center for Former Soviet Studies, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, including the Israel Institute that I co-direct, rely on donations, rely on outside money. There's no harm in that. The, United, the university has very clear rules about what donors may and may not demand, insist, request, mm -hmm. and faculty have very strong thoughts about this. I'll tell you about my... Israel Institute, because I can't speak for Middle East studies, a donor can supply support for a speaker series, but they cannot tell us who to invite. Mm. They can't tell us what these speakers will talk about. They can't tell us how to host and where to host. They, they give us the money and we thank them very much. And that's the end of the relationship. They can, I'll give you another example, the very generous donors, the Helen Diller Foundation, who support our travel to Israel and my chair and have named our institute in supporting that trip to Israel are doing a wonderful thing because I'm taking primarily students who have never been to Israel and would never go to Israel and the non-Jewish travelers. Mm -hmm. And it's a very generous donation. They have never told me who to take, where to take, how to take. Even the birthright trips that go to Israel, even birthright is very hands-off, but birthright has some rules that you need to follow, right? You have to visit a Holocaust institution. You're supposed to visit Jerusalem and the Western Wall, right? There's some boxes you need to tick. My donors would not dare to tell me where to go and what to do. They've never asked me, who's going? How do you pick them? Why are you taking them there and not here? What are you teaching them about Israel? It is. It has to be hands-off. So yes, of course, the Center for Middle East Studies is receiving a lot of money. Of course, that money does not go for hiring experts on the kibbutz movement and, and Talmud experts. I, obviously, it goes towards hiring Middle East people, some of which will be friendly in their scholarship towards Israel. Others will not be. That is not the source of trouble on campus. A source of trouble on campus is, first of all, a bigoted movement that has been around since the founding of Israel, sometimes motivated by uh, Soviet propaganda, sometimes motivated by so-called post-colonial propaganda, a, a sort of sort of slow drip of Israel bad. I think that's essentially post-colonial theory summarized in a sentence, Israel bad. And so some faculty have swallowed that propaganda and are, are passing it on, not just Berkeley, everywhere. I think that's one issue. Things got much worse when progressivism went off the deep end and it became okay again to be a racist, to judge people by their skin color, to say, I'm not going to listen to this person because I don't like what they have to say. I'm not going to talk to this person because they have an Israeli passport. They're dangerous. Their speech is dangerous. These are anti-educational ideas that used to be held by the far right how dare you say this about the Bible? How dare you t teach sexual education in class? That used to be something you'd only get from one extreme. Now you're getting it from the other side. How dare you teach about Israel? How dare you teach about Judaism? I think, I think that's the problem. The movement is not primarily faculty-led, although I, have, I do have a few colleagues who have lost their minds on that front. I have a colleague in, in the history department who will remain unnamed who declared on his uh, Instagram that had he been... Uh, in Gaza on October 7, he would have joined uh, the activists. So that's somebody who needs to be taken away in a straitjacket and locked up in a, in a in a room with very soft walls so that he doesn't harm himself. Um, but but most faculty members here are, are are normal and sane. It is true that there's a horrible war happening in Israel. Israeli soldiers are dying. Israeli civilians are held captive. 
thousands and thousands of Palestinian women and children and civilians are dying, whose responsibility that is, we can maybe discuss in some other conversation. I have strong thoughts about that. But among the Hamas activists that Israel is killing by the thousands are also innocent civilians behind whom those Hamas activists are hiding. And, and that, of course, inflames opinions. As we said at the beginning of this conversation, when that killing stops, two weeks later, Israel and the Palestinian territories will be forgotten, as they always are in these cases. This is not real deep care and concern for the Middle East. Right. I know that. You know that because it's not paralleled by concern for Yemen, for Syria, for the Uyghurs in China, right? It's in large part motivated by Jew hatred. There's no, no doubt in my mind. And animated by images on TV that I'm not responsible for. My insane colleagues are not responsible for. It's it, it's part, I think, of a broader atmosphere. And, and I think there's now a counter movement. Jews have woken up. They understand that radical progressivism which was very hip up to half a year ago, is a trap and a very dangerous oh. game to play. Sorry, and I, well, like you say radical progressivism, in case that term is not landing for people, just define that just a little bit. So I am certainly left of center. I would call myself a liberal, meaning nothing matters more to me than debate, education. I don't judge people by their ancestry and by their skin color. I love my non-Jewish students as much as I love my Jewish students. My non-Jewish students have the good fortune currently of not being assaulted. I love my Muslim students as much as I love my Jewish students. My Muslim students also currently have the luxury of not being assaulted. And by the way, while we're on this, should Jewish students on this campus ever prevent a speaker from talking, which has never happened and will never happen, should they attack other students and because they're cowards wear masks or block a gate, I will speak to them as harshly as I speak to the students who are currently doing this. I consider myself a liberal. This has nothing to do with my politics, which are nobody's business. This has to do with my academic outlook. Mm -hmm. In my class, people argue mm -hmm. and they debate and they disagree and all opinions are permitted and all words are permitted. And I will never, ever judge anybody based on their gender or all the, all the other things that some progressives and extreme, mainly extreme progressives are doing. So, so when I say extreme progressives, I'm talking, first of all, about the plague of identity politics, in which you're only allowed to hang out with people who look like you and think like you and share the same parentage and eat the same food. And students have said to me very innocently because they've been brainwashed. Oh, Ron, your lecture yesterday was was great, but I really wish this class were taught by an African-American professor, someone who I can identify with. All you can do is shake your head and say, if what bothers you most about my lecture is my skin color, that's something I can't control. Yeah, unbelievable. As if only Jews should be teaching the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Or as if only a Jewish professor can teach. One of know. my best professors right now is a, a, a non-Jewish German who's teaching uh, Judaism history from 1492 to uh, Scala. He's brilliant. He's actually yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of a world would that be? in which only only genocide survivors are allowed to teach about genocide. And presumably only Ashkenazi Jews are allowed to teach about Ashkenazi Judaism and Mizrahi Jews are only allowed. And if you're from Yemen, you're not allowed to teach about Iraq. And if you're from Northern Yemen, you're not allowed to teach about Southern Yemen. It's just insanity. So that's what I mean when I say radical progressivism. It's racism, first and foremost. It's censorship, secondary, right? Oh, I don't like what you're saying. So I'm just going to smash the glass and break into your talk and make you run away under police guard. These guys are lunatics. It's also a political idiocy, but, but we don't need to go into that because that's, that's a different conversation. My last question, and I would love to have a follow-up interview and we can take any one of these. Oh, let's talk again in a month when my beard is down to my knees. Oh, yeah. My last question I always ask every guest that's on the Holy Sparks podcast is, what do you feel the Jewish world needs now most and why? Ah, I happen to have an answer to that. I would not have had one a week ago. Students are so sweet about what I've done and enthusiastic. I'm going to get a roundabout. You're going to get a roundabout answer. But not just students. I'm receiving hundreds of emails a day. I'd say about 20 an hour from Uganda, Australia, Brazil. I'm not making these places up. I'm receiving uh, mishlochim, packages of food from uh, people I've never met, pizza delivery, 
Somebody brought me a hot dog recently. It's, it's, it just won't end. By the way, I don't need food. Please, if any of your listeners are, I think that's the issue here. I don't need food. There's too much food. What I'd like people to do is to support Jewish institutions on campus. Chabad, Hillel, Institute for Israel Studies, Center for Jewish Studies, Anti-Semitism Education Initiative. You just Google those. They help students. They support students. They need your help. I don't need your help. I'm doing great because I'm surrounded by love. And many of these messages embarrass me because they talk about how brave I am and how heroic I am. I had a an elderly gentleman in my office who fought with Ariel Sharon at the Suez Canal and told me that I was such a hero. And I, it's, I just find that, of course, flattering. But on the other hand, I find it to be a testament of the very dire straits that we are in as a Jewish community. When a shlemiel with a mattress who has slept in his clothes for a week is the great hero of the Berkeley campus, it's an embarrassment in many ways to to Judaism. And I'm waiting for other shlemiels to pick up mattresses, and it hasn't happened yet. But we'll see. Maybe it'll happen. So what does the, here's the answer to your question after a three-minute speech. What would I like to, your question was, what would I like to, what would I like to, the, for Judaism, what would I like to see what, in the near future? What does Judaism need? Uh, yeah, what, yeah, what do we need right now? Leaders. I'm not one of them. I'm, a, I'm an academic. I'm a geek. I'm a geek with a mattress and a light in his window. We need leaders. We are very good at talking. We are very good at writing statements. I had a Jewish activist in my office who very much enjoyed the limelight of being surrounded by others. So she she gave a 15-minute drosh in the middle of my office that nobody asked her for. And and all she does is talk. And, and all the activists around her do is they talk. They talk and they talk. They give speeches at synagogues. They give speeches on the plaza. They write statements. They write op-eds. The time for talking is done. Zionism means Jews do stuff with their hands with their feet, mm -hmm. with their bodies. Most of the time, what Zionism does is build. On occasion, Zionism clenches its hand into a fist, reluctantly when that's necessary. But Zionism is doing, is standing up for yourself, is not retreating. The messages that make me the saddest are from parents who say, thank you, Ron, for what you're doing. You've taught us that we should never, ever send our children to Berkeley. Come on now. Come on. What are we, 19th century Eastern European Jews running from shtetl to shtetl as the Cossacks chase us? Mm -hmm. We're not doing this stuff anymore. We are 21st century emancipated Jews. When Jews get harassed, we run towards the harassment to stand shoulder to shoulder and support one another. But we need leaders and not some nebuch dick with a mattress. We need doers. Part of that means gathering funds, right? Support your Hillel, support your Chabad. Give students food, give students comfort. Invite them to your house. If they're marching, march with them. If they want to march peacefully, like you did, Saul, join them. If they want to march loudly and angrily, and I bet that's coming next, join them. If they want to engage in, in civil unrest, and that's what they're asking you to do, join them. But you must act. We've got to stop talking all the time, which I'm sorry is maybe not a polite thing to say on a podcast. But I, I see this podcast as not just as not just talk, but also as a form of indirect action of sorts. And after all, I'm doing this podcast from my rather smelly office. So I've taken some, I've taken a pause from, from action to do some talking. Yeah, you need leaders and you need better leaders than me. You need young leaders who will march and who will bang on doors and who will get stuff done. I love it. I will say this in, the, in my last five months worth of podcasting, there's always been an action step that you can do. Either click here to donate to xyz and whatnot so if there's good. anything in in specific that you want people to click on go through look i'm very proud of the fact that my colleagues and i head the helen diller institute for jewish law and israel studies so it does both as a sort of a jew jewish scholarship facing side and an israel scholarship facing side because mm -hmm. of course the two cannot be disentangled right that's why after all that's why anti-zionism is anti-semitism first of all the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies has public events, colloquia, Zoom events, 
lectures classes come you have a jewel of israel studies in your midst attend listen learn something two weeks ago i hosted one of the greatest iran experts in the united states to talk with him for an hour and a half about israel iran relations he met with our undergraduate students he lectured in my class he gave a large public event to 300 people here on campus he then went out to dinner with people who wanted to hear more from him just to learn about the relationship between iran and israel we've been zooming with journalists in israel human rights activists we've been talking to psychologists in israel of course policymakers uh, political scientists gender scholars legal scholars the community should attend those events and educate itself if you like those events enough such that you would like them to continue, please help us continue. We take students to Israel for months in the summer. I take students to Israel for days every winter. We reach a thousand students in our classes every year. Support us. You can support us. You can support the Center for Jewish Studies. We have we are the only university in the United States with a Jewish museum, the Magnus. Amazing. Visit the Magnus. Support the Magnus. Donate things to the Magnus. Come to the Magnus and help curate. Move your bodies onto our campus. This campus cannot be abandoned by Jews. There was a time when someone could say, and I would have disagreed with them, but they could have said, we're leaving Berkeley. Our kids will only go to Stanford and Harvard where Jews are safe. Huh, what did you learn? You run to Harvard, they'll chase you from there. Run from Harvard to Brown. It's not far. They'll chase you from there. Wherever Jews run, anti-Jews will chase them. So stand your ground. Yeah, I was asked by a colleague who's a, a cantor at a shul in, in Florida. I was on tour there and she said, Saul, we're, we're thinking about going. Where are you guys going? I said, I'm staying here and fighting for our people. That's what we're doing. Yep. I, I would never criticize somebody who's going to Israel, right? Neither would you, I don't think. No. There's, it's important to go to Israel. And I suspect that if American academia continues to be racist in its admissions policies and discriminate against Asian Americans, against Jews, against, I'm hearing this from Armenian Americans, Iranian Americans, all of whom have not been persecuted enough in order to uh, gain admission to American campuses. If that kind of discrimination continues, then of course our kids will start studying in Israel. And that's going to be fantastic for Israel. And it's going to be awful for the United States. Just as German Jews at some point started sending their kids to study in other places because they weren't safe. That might happen here too. But yes, I'm here. My family's here. This is my campus. And I'm standing my ground. I love it. Ron, thank you so much for your time. We're going to wrap up here. And I always want to end with a blessing that Hashem should bless you, that your sit-in should be productive and that not only in creating community and creating a safe space for students, but that the university should actually act on the things that you're saying. They're very simple. It's actually really very good. simple. It could all get done today and you could have a shower tonight. Bezrat Hashem. And uh, I want to thank you for everything that you're doing. And most of all, thank you for your time. And we hopefully we'll see you very soon. Toda Shaul.